Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Bob Mann, professor at LSU's Manship School of Mass Communication. Almost one-fifth of Louisianians live in poverty. Many members of the middle class, however, has, have misconceptions about what living in poverty is like. There's little consensus about what can be done to end poverty. Over the next hour, we'll hear from academics, policy experts, and charity representatives as we explore living below the poverty line. If you think about it in baseball terms, my kids, um, in order to achieve the American dream, they're already on third base and just have to run home. But a child that is living in poverty is standing in the batter's box. He has no balls and two strikes. Belinda Davis teaches a course about poverty at LSU. She says there's a misconception that poor people don't have money because they made bad choices. But poverty is generational, she says. If an individual lives in poverty, um, a large chunk of the reason they're in poverty, um, those the decisions were made for them before they were 18. Janet Simmons is director of Hope Ministries. Her organization tries to help people understand what living in poverty is like. There are four things that research has shown are um, causes of poverty, one of only which is behavior. One of the causes is predators, such as payday lenders. Another is government policies. You don't pay your insurance and you get a flag on your tag, right? And so now you not only owe your insurance, you owe your flag on your tag. Well, then if you can't pay your insurance in 30 days, your flag gets increased. That becomes almost unescapable, Simmons says. And you have a flag on your tag and you get stopped, then your car gets confiscated your license gets confiscated and you can't drive to work. Well, if you can't drive to work, you lose your job. The conditions of the community are the last cause Simmons cites. Do you have affordable housing? What's your transportation system like? You know, that's one of the biggest problems in Baton Rouge right now. Hope also offers programs to help people lift themselves above those causes. Just paying for somebody's rent for three months is not gonna change their possibility of being evicted. You've got to change it over time. Charlene Ellsworth coordinates the food pantry at Hope. She says Hope's teachers and classes have changed her way of thinking. If I would have known the things that he was teaching me and encouraging me to do in the class back in the ninth grade, I would have never dropped out. I would have had that push, that motivation to do exactly what I'm trying to do now. Simmons says the poor are disproportionately impacted by the hurdles in life. They don't have the financial safety net of the middle class or the financial know-how. Now, I've made poor choices, but it hasn't caused me to be evicted from my home. Um, so a lot of times, poor choices cause a devastating effect for somebody in generational poverty, whereas a poor, cho poor choice for me may mean that I just don't go to the movies this month. The hurdle is the knowledge of living check for check, like the knowledge of having a budget. Simple stuff, simple stuff that means simple, be simple to you or simple to others. But that was a big thing to me. Randy Nichols leads a program that helps the poorest of the poor, the Capital Area Alliance for the Homeless. I think that one of the things about living in poverty is to live in uncertainty all the time. To always be uncertain if, if the income you have is going to be enough to, uh, to, to meet your very basic needs. Some argue that living in poverty in Louisiana isn't that bad. According to a study by the Heritage Foundation before the recession, 80% of poor households across the nation had air conditioning, three quarters had at least one car, and 97% owned a color television. In Louisiana, the cost of living is lower than most of the nation. The life of a child living in poverty um, is not one um, that you would want for your children. And that's what I would say to people who say, well, being poor in America is really not that bad. 
Well, I would ask, do you want your child growing up in poverty in the United States? And I think that the overwhelming answer to that is no. Davis says the programs the government provides often encourage work. Programs like food stamps, also called SNAP benefits, the earned income tax credit, and temporary assistance for needy families. But not all of them work as well as intended. Women who leave temporary assistance for needy families are still reliant on a whole host of government programs because their wages are not enough to lift them above the poverty line. And that's in, in part a function of how low our minimum wage is. Davis says it's mathematically impossible to work a 40-hour work week on minimum wage and live above the poverty line. Nichols says government programs aren't just the socially responsible choice, they're fiscally responsible as well. Homelessness and poverty is not free to the public. Uh, it's not as if uh, it does not cost the community something uh, for people to remain in poverty and homelessness. But Simmons says more thought needs to be put into government programs. I think a lot of government pro programs have been designed by people who are not in the trenches, and so they don't know what works, and so they have this mindset that, oh, I think this we need to do this. So welfare, for example. Oh, we just need to give them food stamps, and we just need to pay for rent or whatever, subsidies, but their programs are not designed to help people get out of poverty. So all they're doing is helping people stay in poverty. Ellsworth says she doesn't blame the middle class for having misconceptions about the poor. That, too, will take education. I don't think it's their fault that they don't know. That's just like me. I'm in poverty. I don't know about, like, their life, they up going. It's not their fault. Joining us on Living Below the Line is our studio audience tonight. It includes representatives from the Society of St. Vincent de Paul as well as members of the Legislative Youth Advisory Council. We also have students from LSU and Southern Universities. Thanks to every one of you for being here. There's a misconception surrounding how much Louisiana spends on welfare programs. In a survey LSU conducted earlier this year, almost 40% of respondents said welfare programs get more money than any other part of the budget, but actually, Welfare programs get less than 1% of state funds. The survey also found that a substantial portion of respondents, almost half, support cutting funding for public assistance programs. Only 18% said it should be increased. So let's start there. What is the role of government in helping the poor? What should the government do? What should be left to the charities? Dan? Well, I was thinking of uh, medical and health care uh, for people who are not able to afford it. But it seems to me that would be um, a responsibility of the government uh, to help take care of that um, expense uh, of families. And so that's why I would, you know, for one, would support Medicaid expansion in Louisiana. There's a, there's a debate going on, you know, in this, in this country right now that churches ought to do more and some people want the government to completely get out of the business of, of dealing with, uh, with the poor, that the churches ought to take up the responsibility completely. Does anybody want to answer that sort of decision about where the government should be stepping back and where churches and nonprofits should be stepping forward? Is that, what, is that the debate we ought to be having in this country? I don't, I don't think so. I, absolutely not. I mean, the, the role of the government is to, to take care of those who are most vulnerable as a matter of basic justice. I think where the churches come in is, is what goes beyond justice mm -hmm. and to the issue of charity. <clears throat> and that's where the churches come in and, and, and I work for the church, and, and that's what we do. Um, we take care of, of the, the, the needs of people beyond that that they're entitled to from, from a basic sense of justice. And, and I think the measure of any institution, government or church, is how well the most vulnerable people are faring. Mm -hmm. Denise, you, you work at St. Vincent de Paul, the, the, yes. the, the, and, and you, you feed people every day who are hungry, right? Yes. And you see that, 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 that those are people that the government in some way is not uh, able to provide them the, what they need to, to, to just take care of their basic needs, right? Well, the thing about it is, is the need is great. And when the government feels like um, they've done enough, um, the nonprofit organization steps in. But mm -hmm. what you got to realize is the churches. And, and just normal people help make the nonprofit organizations make us be able to feed the people that we feed. Um, the government programs are limited to as far as meals are concerned. 
if it wasn't for churches and different grants and stuff that we have, nonprofit would be simply non-existent to be able to help the poor and the needy. Michael, you want to talk about that? I mean, you're, you're, you're really on the front lines of this at St. Vincent de Paul, right? Yes, we are, and, and Denise does a phenomenal job for us. 240,000 meals that she was responsible for right in the capital city, doing a terrific job. And I think it's a marriage between government programs and charitable programs coming together. I think charities move very well in filling gaps. Uh, often with government type programs there's a lot of documentation mm -hmm. and other requirements that sometimes may slow the process whereas I think charities are able to respond local groups that really come together whether it's hot meals or prescriptions our St. Vincent de Paul Community Pharmacy in Baton Rouge filled over 30,000 prescriptions that would have otherwise gone unfilled right here in the capital region so it's really important that government programs and charities work together in a collaborative sense so that we can help people who truly need a helping hand. One example of that is Reginald Brown, your group, Holiday Helpers, you're, you're, you're doing some incredible work in this community. Tell us about that. Well, we sort of joined with uh, St. Vincent de Paul in making sure that we provide, but we do it just on three days or three occasions in a year, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter. But the Thanksgiving meal that we serve, uh, we, we make sure that whatever's left, St. Vincent de Paul gets the, the, the remainder part of that. But I think from a law enforcement perspective in which I, I, uh, I have a career in of over 40 years, I've seen so many people come into the prison system, and most of them that come into the prison system have average of a fifth grade education. And I'm talking about this average in a prison system. So, that, And I've talked to prisoners and persons that are of the free society today, and one of the biggest things they find is that we have to in America realize that everybody is not going to go to a college and get a college degree. Everybody doesn't want a college degree, but everybody wants to be successful. They should have the opportunity. And I think this is where the government, churches, and everybody can engage in encouraging us to develop early skill curriculum programs for children to be in from middle schools on up. You should know a kid should have some idea of what he or she wants to be. When they tell you they want to be a truck driver, a landscape architect, a mechanic, or a barber, a beautician, a nail tech, and things of that nature, you should be designing an education platform by which they will go into that and start being able to uh, prepare themselves for that future, rather than graduate them or push them to graduate from high school, which a lot of them don't do. They fail because they become interested, disinterested, and uh, you don't give them that opportunity to make a, a good career selection. But if we did that, I think we would make a big difference and we'd start right at the use, right at the core of where the problem is. You talk about education. We've got a couple of students in the audience tonight. What, uh, young people, and you're, I'm sure you work with uh, some, some underprivileged youth, and you see the difference that education can make in, in those lives. One of you want to comment on that? Oh, yeah. I kind of agree with what he's saying. Like, um, when it comes to uh, directing education, everything we learn is kind of pushing us to join college, you know, but there's a whole lot of other opportunities that we could have, like going into a job like welding or something like that, that there's no, if I wanted to be a welder, there's no opportunity for me to be a welder in my high school. They get rid of all those courses because they're dangerous or whatever. There's no wood shop and a lot of stuff like that. There's nothing to encourage you to do anything other than achieve college, and that's not for a lot of people, people who aren't academic-minded. So I feel like the education system kind of leaves a lot of people in the dust when it comes to trying to encourage them to be productive in their lives. We've been talking in the state for as long as I can remember about workforce development, about having the, the, the schools more involved in, in training. Does anybody have some thoughts about you know, maybe why that, that, that those, these problems still exist after we've been talking about them and dealing with them for so, so, so long? Well, I do. I work with a, a school psychology consultation team in the lower econ um, socioeconomic schools, uh, the elementary ones, and I think there's a large disconnect between what is supposed to take place at home and what a teacher's role is in a child's life. And because of this disconnect, there are just certain children that are growing up in an environment such as poverty where teachers don't want to have the patience to teach them so they want to push them to a side where you you do you kind of um, 
you segregate these kids into an area where well, we don't want to deal with these behaviors as a result of something we have no control over, such as poverty, so we'll push them to the side. So even if there are training plans implemented, they won't get that advantage because they're kind of discredited for something they have no control over, which as he said, it starts at youth, so if we discredit at this kind of level, how will they ever have any opportunity, even at a college or a welding level, if, even if that was something they desired? What, what, what is the role of the schools in all of this? I mean, the, 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 the schools get a lot of blame, but the schools also get a lot of credit for, for training. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've had the opportunity to go um, be a part of the public education system since I was in elementary school. Um, and there are, of course, all of these problems do exist, and I see them every single day. Um, but there are positives um, that I have seen in my experience as well. Um, you know, I, I currently attend Baton Rouge High, and a lot of our students, you know, we do a lot of community service work. Um, so that's dealing with people that live under the poverty line. But what's interesting to me is a lot of the students that volunteer um, in these community uh, involvement efforts are living under the poverty line themselves. Um, and but but what's interesting is a lot of our students. You know, one of my classmates, for example, um, she goes out and does work outside of school as well. So she works at a restaurant, and um, every single day that you know they make fresh food. Every single day after um, you know they've closed all of their remaining food, every single day they donate it to the soup kitchen, um, and that food is served there itself. Um, and you know, as a part of like school newspaper and publicity, you know, we publicize these events, uh, and in a way, it inspires other students to go out and do the same thing. So while these issues do exist in terms of you know. Sometimes we don't offer the education for those that don't want to go to college. Um, there are some positives um, that kind of shine a light on the rest of the issues that are going on so that even those that are living under the poverty line are doing something to help others that are also living under the poverty line. That's a great point and, and I wonder if any of you have any thoughts about the way that our society vilifies the poor and uh, we saw on, in the segment before about some people think that if you have a color television, you should you might, must not be poor. If you have a car, you must not be poor. <laughs> no, I hear a lot of laughs. I mean, but do we in this state do we do we really understand poverty? What what, what are the misconceptions that we have? I feel like it's uh, I feel like it's so prejudged. You know, people um, it's just like what she was saying. People feel like as if that oh well you just you must just be lazy or you must not you just be making horrible decisions. But if people don't really understand, especially youth. Like I remember being in high school, I'm in college now and I'm graduating, but I just remember being in high school and you see these people who may not, they don't, they're not pushed, they're not encouraged, they're not given the support and the care that I believe that is essential is, is in molding the mentality of, of being a perseverance in anybody. And when you lack that type of support from the people who you, who you would think are supposed to be encouraging you to further your education, then that that constrains your way of thinking. So you're just like, man, like I'm I'm in this place and I'm by myself, and the people who are supposed to help me are not even willing to help me. So what is there for me to do, or what can I do? And it's just like you, it's just a constant. You know, we talk about in America. You know, you pull yourself up from your bootstraps and this American dream that that is so you know fabricated in a lot of different ways but I feel like if we have more support within not only the school system but even the government you know you giving me all this stuff you giving me food stamps all these things but there's no real care is there real is there real support in this but I can go into an impoverished community and I look at the roads and it's a mess I look at the houses and it's a mess and I look on the outside and you won't even support what I'm what is actually like um, city property, you know, in that community, then how can I expect to even excel in this society when I don't feel like it supports me? Very well said. Very well said. So that's all the time we have for this portion of our show. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further explore living below the line. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight, we're discussing the causes and solutions to poverty in our state. Joining us now is our panel of experts. Herbert Dixon is Outreach Director for the Louisiana Workforce Commission. His work focuses on connecting people in the Delta parishes of East and Northeast Louisiana with quality jobs to lift them out of the cycle of poverty. Carmen Wiesner is the Executive Director of the Louisiana Chapter of the National Association of Social Workers. 
Her profession is devoted to helping people function the best they can in their environment. Darren Goss is the president, CEO of Capital Area United Way. His organization's mission is to advance the common good through education, income, stability, and healthy living. And Jan Muller is director of the Louisiana Budget Project, which monitors and reports on state government spending and how it affects Louisiana's low to moderate income families. Before we go to our audience for questions, I'd like to first ask each of you to talk about one tactic that you champion to overcome poverty from your perspective or your association or your organization. Mr. Dixon, would you like to start and tell us what that one tactic is? Well, I hope I'm in the midst of that tactic now. Uh, I work for the Louisiana Workforce Commission and as uh, indicated earlier, as outreach director focusing, focusing on the Delta area, Northeast Louisiana. And in Northeast Louisiana is an area where you have the highest amount of percentage poverty anywhere in the state of Louisiana. And hopefully what we're trying to do with the new Workforce Innovative uh, Innovation Opportunity Act, which is a federal uh, program that started July 1, and that program seeks to remove barriers from uh, individuals seeking to work in the state of Louisiana. And my job <coughs> is to get those individuals familiar with this new program. Ms. Weister? Um, as a social worker, uh, I've been uh, involved with many facets of working with people, as do the other members of the profession. And we normally work primarily with the disadvantaged or those that are in need of some sort of supportive services. So many of the members of my profession are working with those who are um, in poverty or have significant behavioral health issues or they're in the child welfare system and at risk of homelessness um, and um, unemployment. Uh, so we work together. We start where the person is and we try and develop a process and a case plan to help them maximize their full potential. But there are lots of barriers that face those individuals and we have to work together with the government and nonprofits and our faith-based organizations to try and achieve an, a way to overcome those barriers. Mr. Goss. Yeah, I, I, I have the great privilege of working in an in a organization that sits what we think is at the intersection of government, of the faith community, of the nonprofit sector. Um, and uh, one of the biggest strategies that we're undertaking right now is this idea that it takes multiple good solutions that are focused on results for individuals and families to really um, move the needle uh, for people in poverty so that there's no single issue or no single program solution but a collection of well-run quality programs that we can fund and leverage the, both the time, talent, and treasure of donors and volunteers to really move the needle. And so and we're excited about that. Um, we, we work across geographic boundaries as well as political boundaries. Uh, we like to say we're politically agnostic. We will work with anyone who's interested in moving people from where they are, meeting them where they are, and moving them um, to financial stability. And so uh, that's our work, and we're, we're very excited about um, what we're doing in that, in that space as a United Way. Very good. Mr. Muller. Uh, well, at the Budget Project, uh, we think government really has a, an important role to play in, in fighting poverty at all levels, starting with our youngest children. We know that uh, in the long-term solution to poverty involves investing in the youngest children, birth to three. Uh, and there was a program here last month on Public Square looking at early childhood education. We know that's one of the best investments that the state can make in, in the youngest children in high-quality child care. Uh, if you provide that, we know a child is less likely to grow up poor, more likely to reach the middle class. In the middle term, I think we can do things that uh, Representative Dixon was talking about, and that's uh, workforce training, making sure people have the, the training to find good jobs, whether it's a, a welding certificate all the way up to a Ph.D. This is something that the state can invest in. But then uh, there's also a lot of people who need help today, and I think government policy can play an important role right there, and that's where programs like the Earned Income Tax Credit, like a higher minimum wage, and like expanding Medicaid can really make a difference in the lives of people. Not everybody can be a welder, not everybody can be a beautician. There's still people who are going to be working in the tourist industry, in, in retail, uh, at restaurants, at jobs that don't, you know, 
<laughs> at hard jobs that just don't pay enough to make a living wage. And I think government can play an important role in providing supports and letting people have the dignity of, of a paycheck that puts a roof over their head, uh, food in their stomach, and provides them with a basic safety net. Okay, so thanks for getting us off to a good start on this. Let's uh, go now to our participants for uh, their questions to our panelists. And we're going to start with uh, Michael Acaldo and your, your question. My question is to Darren Goss of the United Way. How can individuals and businesses get behind and get behind an effort, the Capital Area United Way, to combat poverty? What can they do? Uh, Constable Brown's got holiday helpers. He's engaged, but not everybody is as innovative and creative as, as Constable Brown. What can individuals, businesses do to get behind the work of United Way? Yeah, I think, Michael, I think one of the first things that um, I think in general that businesses and individuals can do is a lot of what's been discussed already, and that's really understand what it means to live in poverty and really understand that um, people who actually find themselves in a situation, uh, for the most part, I've never met a person who would prefer to eat at a soup kitchen. I, I think they would prefer to eat at home. And so I think a, a big part uh, of what um, businesses, individuals can do is really educate themselves about what this, what this situation is. Then, um, not only give, and, and we, we promote giving to the United Way and to charity, but also um, lend time and talent to the efforts as well. I think, uh, and I, someone uh, said this earlier, um, when, when you just do a sort of, we call it checkbook philanthropy, write a check and then, and then go away, that's powerful, but it's even more powerful and even more substantial when you write that check, you volunteer at your location or at Hope Ministries, and you look across the table from someone and you provide that, that glimpse of hope. I think you can make it. I think um, this is, you, there's, a, there's a way out for you. Let me talk to you. So we, we promote things like mentoring. We promote things like tutoring. We promote things like coaching through our women's leadership program. Uh, these women are coming face to face with single moms, trying to work with them to move them up. Sometimes it, that, that volunteer hour, that time that people spend um, letting other people know that, that they love them and that they're human and they care about their humanity, is so impactful and extends the reach of that dollar. And, and so I think that's a big part of what, um, what folks can do to support uh, folks who, who live in this, in this situation. I want to go to Ruth now. Ruth, um, you've got a question about the intersection of poverty and health care and the impact of that. Share that with, your, with the panelists. After spending 35 years at L.K. Long Hospital, I can very well tell you what it's like to deal with folks that are in poverty, all the students and what have you. That, the place wasn't what it should be, but it could have stayed right there to help the people. We have had so many come through that needed some help. And where they have taken these people now, it's horrible. So wh where, where do we stand? Somebody want to, uh, Jan, you want to take that question about health care and the, the role it plays in poverty? A absolutely. I mean, one of the things about health care, I mean, we not only need it to stay healthy, but, but we know that uh, health care bills are, are the leading cause of bankruptcy. And so, so many people who maybe, you, maybe you're living below the poverty line or maybe you're just above the poverty line. You have enough each month to pay your bills, but if something goes wrong, if you get sick or you have an accident, you can be left with Medica medical bills that can plunge you into poverty very quickly. And I think that's why Medicaid expansion is such an important policy, not just for the public health, but because uh, it will help people uh, keep them from having those massive bills when something goes wrong. There was a study in Oregon uh, where they did an experiment and, and a bunch of people got Medicaid uh, and some people didn't get it. And they found that the people who got Medicaid, they, uh, it virtually eliminated catastrophic medica medical expenses for that population. So when we talk about a safety net, we're not just talking about you know, a welfare check, we're really talking about a safety net that helps you when, when life's unfortunate events which are going to happen to all of us at some point come along and that should not, getting sick should not leave you financially destitute. The charity hospital system provided that safety net in this state for 70 years, but we don't have a charity hospital system anymore and that's why Medicaid expansion is so vitally important to keep people uh, healthy but also from being financially destitute. 
Anybody else want to talk about health care before yeah, we move on? Yeah, I, I do. In terms of um, people who, who live in poverty, um, they have very poor health outcomes, and so they, they are at a disadvantage when it comes to maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Some individuals who live in parts of a city, particularly here in Baton Rouge, live in areas where there's food deserts, so they don't have access to quality, healthy foods. Mm -hmm. And so their diets may, may not you know, be supportive of a healthy lifestyle. They may not have access to a um, personal physician, so they have to rely on clinics. Uh, and those clinics may not be able to see them at the time that their time frames are, are demanding because they're working two and three jobs. Um, so it's availability. Uh, and uh, the potential for them to have very poor health outcomes. Okay. I want to go to Reggie. Uh, Reggie, you've got a, you've got a question. I worked with several volunteer organizations and have spent a lot of time since I've stopped working. Um, and I try to pride myself on knowing what resources are out there. Mm -hmm. But the issue that I see in most all cases is that need for immediate emergency assistance. And the frustration is that although we all do great work and we're trying our best, we have so much red tape. How do we promote and encourage those that are providing immediate assistance to those that really need it? I mean respond to that. Uh, I tried to do in my introductory remarks talk about the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. That act came into existence the first of July of this year. So you have across the state of Louisiana directors, the Workforce Investment uh, Board, uh, the Workforce Development Boards that are regional throughout the state of Louisiana. They're putting the fine print to exactly how this program is going to work. But what's right now for available for individuals that are look, looking for immediate assistance are business career solution centers. If you go to LAWorks.net, uh, uh, you can find business career solution centers scattered throughout the state of Louisiana. In those centers, you could get uh, assistance with transportation, assistance with furthering your education. You could get scholarships to technical community college. You could get uh, information on how to form your resume. You can get tutorial help to help you uh, pass the high set, which uh, took the place of the GED. I mean, right across the state of Louisiana, federally funded through the WIOA Act, our workforce uh, efforts in each community where individuals could come right now, today, tomorrow, and start a process by which they can build a pathway to better their lives. And it's a little known uh, uh, entity out there in the, in the greater uh, uh, world of Louisiana, and hopefully the Workforce Commission can get this word out that uh, we have those things available for citizens. Okay. Yeah, now if, if, if I can yeah, just weigh in on that real quickly, um, th I think there are two, two, two things embedded in that question. One is, there's the access question. So um, how can a person find out what resources are available immediately? Well, y we have something in this state called Louisiana 211, United Way 211 in our region. You can pick up the phone, dial that number, and it can put you in touch with people. The second question, Reggie, then is do, do the agencies I contact have the actual, can, can they provide the service? And that now becomes a question of, of capacity. And so a part of what I think as we change our process, we're saying is we want to we want to intentionally partner with those people who are working in the space that, because we know that no, not one agency, not one program, not just a United Way can meet the needs. Not churches can't do it by themselves. So how do we make sure that it is the question we're wrestling with? How do we make sure that when a person has an immediate need, if they can't get it from St. Vincent de Paul or Catholic Charities or one of our local uh, agencies, is there a tight referral system that gets that person the need, uh, the need they have? And then what's the next step in, 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 in for that person? So once that immediate need has been met, what's next for them? Because we should be asking that next question because it's not going to be sufficient for, to just do this for one month you're going to have a shortfall next month. What's the plan for you to make sure that you have 
some some <laughs> d direction, some plan for for what happens next, and that's a part of how we're changing. It's a part of the conversation that we're having across. Um, frankly, the landscape of philanthropy as well as our, our corporate partners as well. So I think there's the access question, but there's also the capacity question, and, and, and I think we have to address both. Robert, uh, you had a question about, about children in poverty. Children in Louisiana are sicker, hungrier, um, poorer, and more at risk than children in all but two other states in the whole country. We're stuck, it seems to me, in, in a, a system where you're either defined as a liberal or a conservative, as a tax and spend person or a fiscal hawk. How can we get beyond those labels and agree that we need to focus on our children? Um, and, and so how do we do that? Our children are our, our, our future. And 28% of the children in this state live at or below poverty, the poverty level. They don't they're not, they don't choose to be born into poverty. So for the children, we have to look at the whole family and we have to work with the families to help m move them out of poverty. Many of our families who are in poverty are, are faced with, they're, they're working multiple jobs, they're minimum wage, they're not, they're not, many of them aren't working 40 hours a week they have no benefits, and when they have a crisis, a health care crisis, a broken car, um, they can't pay the utility bills, etc., the children are the ones that suffer. And we want the 28% the of the children living in poverty to be kind of a backdrop, and we don't want to talk about it because it's the community's dirty little secret. But those are our children. And if we want to improve their lives, we have to work together, irregardless of whether we are a liberal or a conservative, um, faith-based organization, atheist. The children are the ones who need to be lifted up. Um, the children will be the ones who will take care of all of us as we age. So we need to be paying attention to them. Um, so. Um, that's, that's years, my lens. Years were not liberal or, or conservative. Uh, SASA, a company, South African company in Lake Charles, that's going to produce 5,000 jobs with an average salary of $77,000 a year. Years was not liberal or conservative. Uh, a company from Lithuania that's going to exist in Pollock, Louisiana, that's in Grant Parish, that's going to provide 584 jobs with an average salary plus benefits of $55,000 a year. The way you help a child is to educate and train the mama and daddy into fields that's going to produce them a quality of life whereby uh, it won't matter whether you're liberal or conservative. They're going to be coming from an income-based uh, family that can provide them environmental experiences that's going to serve them in a positive way for the rest of their lives. Jan, I want to get somebody else in here, but I want, I want you, you, you deal in this from the, the intersection of politics and, and these issues, right? Your question is right on point, and this speaks to why income support programs like the Earned Income Tax Credit and, and frankly, a higher minimum wage are so important because research very clearly shows that if we can bring <coughs> parents uh, and families just slightly above the poverty line, but, but so that they're not living hand to mouth every month, the chances of those children graduating from high school, going on to becoming productive citizens, staying out of the criminal justice system, go up. So, so when we invest in families, we invest in communities and we invest in those children. And I think, uh, you know, this notion that, that if we invest in low income families, we're taking from somebody else, I think is what we need to get beyond politically because when we lift up people at the bottom, families at the bottom, we all are invested in that. And, and I think we're stronger as an economy, as a community, mm -hmm. when everybody does well. And, and I think government uh, shouldn't, isn't solely responsible for that by any stretch. And, and uh, charities and, and families have to do their part. But I think if we can just lift families just above that poverty line and into the middle class and provide a sound safety net underneath them, with health care policies uh, and income supports uh, that it helps everybody because don't forget when you give 
somebody a higher wage. When they when you when somebody has a job that 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 pays a living wage, they spend that money in those communities. Those that money supports jobs and it becomes a virtuous cycle that helps not just the families but but the children and, and kind of moves us all forward. So I think uh, it, you know and government policy has a very important role to play in that. You know, I I, I just want to just add something to that. Um, we have a new superintendent in East Baton Rouge Parish Schools, and I work with two superintendents, one in St. Um, Helena and the other one in West Feliciana, and it's, it, it's, it's remarkable to me that every time I talk to those superintendents and they, and they talk about the issues that they face, their school districts, um, they, always, they always lead with this when we go talk to them, what's best for children? And I think on, on both ends of the spectrum, I think the question we have to ask ourselves as, as people who work in the space is, is what we're doing best for children? Policy-wise, program-wise, is it best for children? If it's not, then we probably should take a step back and really think about what we're doing. Um, because if it's not, then we, we probably need to take a different approach or a different strategy. So can, Bob, can I just yeah, chime in on this right here? Um, I, I, the, as far as the education level, we emphasize, you know, children are 20% here in Louisiana, say Louisiana. I guess my question is, I noticed um, working in the educational community, the elementary schools here locally, that a lot of the children there in those um, public or the public schools versus the private sector of schools, their scores are lower. Is there, how are they going to change the educational output for those kids versus the, pri the kids in private schools when clearly they are mostly in poverty and they can't afford private schooling, which clearly indicates that they're not going to get the same education, which means we're kind of creating, perpetuating that cycle of lesser education and it shows in the scores, in the schooling. How, what are well, we, many is there the programs that we're implementing that we can change you, these? When you look at the children um, who are in the, the private schools and whatever, they have probably both parents in the home the parents are there in the afternoon and at night to help guide them in their studies to help tutor them. On the, on the other side of the spectrum, um, this may be the home with just a single parent. She's working two jobs uh, and by the time she gets home, the children probably are asleep. So she's, she may herself not have um, more than a third or fourth grade education and doesn't have the capacity nor the time to sit, sit with her child and do the tutoring. Many of the children in those lower uh, grades, if you t ask them, they don't have any books at home. No one reads to them. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's a, a whole deficit there. And that's why when the schools look for volunteers in school to help those children, you know, someone tutoring, someone reading to the children, uh, someone paying attention to them to, to, to help guide them. And so it is a community investment to help particularly those children. You know, I heard Dr. Kelly Joseph, who's the superintendent of St. Helena Schools, one of, the, one of the lowest performing school districts in the state, but improving. She said this one day at a board meeting. She said that the expectations we set, the, th the way we talk about our schools, really set an expectation in that classroom for the child because they hear what we say about their schools. And so a, a big part of, I think, what can help shift some of that because, because in every school district, in every southern state, poorest performing or highest performing, they're children who succeed. They're children who go on and become very successful <coughs> in life. And so a part of what money can't buy is what we talked about earlier, and that is a caring adult. Maybe it's not the mom. Maybe it's not uh, 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 another caring adult, but maybe it is a corporate volunteer who's going to sit down with that child and read with them. Maybe it's a program like we sponsor with the United Way called Dolly Parton Imagination Library that sends a book age appropriate to the home addressed in the kid's name so that they start to create a print rich environment, a library for that kid from the time they're zero to five. It's those types of opportunities, the expectations we set, the language we use about whether they can achieve or not, that I think creates sort of, or and it actually perpetuates this idea that somehow they're inferior, somehow the school is inferior, and so now why do I even try? I think we have to change our language when we talk about children and when we talk about schools 
and, and instead of a deficit mindset, talk about the assets. There, there's some great things going on in these communities, and I think we need to tap into that and provide the extra supports um, that may be non-traditional. Challenge our schools to, to open up hours mm -hmm. <laughs> that create the opportunity for that single mom to be there to help that child after school. So I just, I just want to make sure that we, that we start to talk differently and set a different expectation for our, for our children. It, it, you're Let's go right. to, uh, we do have to do that. Um, but we also have to look at some realities. I mean, mm -hmm. there was a study, I guess, a few months ago that showed the southern states have probably the highest suspension rate uh, throughout the United States. And if we don't have enough systematic caring where we're going to keep the kid in school no matter what happens to make sure they get the education, then we're going to lose those kids. I mean, I see them because you know when they are suspended from school they come into the Gardere initiative yeah. and I sit with them and I make sure that they do their work yeah. but if I'm sorry they have to do that in school that is what the school is there for you can't just say strike one you're out yeah. sure you can't do that sure and, and I'm not talking to you guys yeah. but yeah. Yeah. someone want to take That's take that uh, yep. he, he bring, he, he, Reggie brings a, a very important point and you have a school year that's over 170 something days a year and uh, children are in that uh, school environment uh, seven hours a day five days a, a week uh, they're in that school with the custodian the teacher and the other individuals probably more than they are with their fathers mm -hmm. and in some instances their mother that's working two jobs and so uh, if you put that kid out, what several things are at play. Many local school systems don't have the financial base to continue with alternative program that can remove that student from maybe his uh, regular setting but continue him on an educational track where he's not missing too much. Now you have school system because of dollars, they have to send that kid home. And at home, there's no one there that's going to train that student. And if there are no programs like you have, then uh, that student uh, is, is even further behind. And that's going to be a student down the, down the road that we're going to be paying for in one way or another. Right. So you, you bring out a very important point. We have to find and devise means by which we can keep those kids in school. But mind you, we can't have those students disrupting the class classes of uh, 20 other students that are trying to improve themselves. So we've got to find where that balance is and, uh, and, and, and move from there. I want to go to uh, Perry now. He's got a, got a question about something kind of related to what we were just talking about. Yeah. Um, two weeks ago, I was uh, actually a, a presenter at the Advancing Justice uh, Conference in New Orleans, uh, <coughs> sponsored by the Charles Koch Institute, and the topic was uh, pretty much discussing uh, the burden of mass incarceration in the United States. And I presented on the incalculable cost of mass incarceration, the cost of what that puts a person, the position that it puts that lifestyle of that person, uh, regardless of when they go in and when they go out. Um, one of the studies that was presented during this conference was uh, that during the fifth and fourth grade years uh, that they're now doing studies that are pretty much writing students off saying if they're not up to this level at this point in their development that this child is most likely is going to end up in the criminal justice system and with something like that already writing the kids off at fourth and fifth grade when there's always through twelfth grade there's a chance or opportunity for that child to get on track regardless of if it's going to college or regardless if it's a secondary uh, education or whatever path that they want to go into. Uh, but the main issue was what do we do to decrease recidivism as far as if I go to prison, um, I may not have any skills, I may not have any trades, I may have not an e education to once I get out, what can I do in order to get myself back on track? Because uh, the United States is the number one that incar incarcerates more citizens than any other uh, country in the world, and Louisiana being the number one incarcerated state mm -hmm. in the, within the United States, mm -hmm. uh, we have so many people that go into the system where the education system may have given up on them, where society may have given up on them, but once they get out, 
you have those who want to make a change, but because when they get out, the burdens of what incarceration has done to them, they may not have the ability to go to college because they don't have the access to Pell Grants. They may not have the ability to go to college because of the, the, the lack of ex access to student loans or just the simple fact of jobs. Who wants to hire you when you have to put on your job application that you are a felon? So so let's, let's who wants to take that question? What, what do we do about this, uh, this problem with people who are coming out of prison? Uh, well, I, I think you raise an excellent point. Louisiana has the highest incarceration rate in the entire world. What's less known is that we also have the lowest per diem for, for prisoners in the state system of any state in the South, and we spend less on rehabilitation in our prisons than any other state in the South. So one thing we can do to uh, reduce recidivism, you know, we have 15 to 17,000 people coming out of prison in Louisiana every year out on our streets, and, and most of those people, I think, want to get a job, want to be contributing members of society, but, but when they're inside, they don't have access to the kind of rehabilitation services, the kind of education services that could maybe equip them to get a job once they're on the outside. So I, I think one thing that the state could do, ironically, we're spending so much money on incarceration, but we're not spending that money wisely, and we're not spending enough to make sure that people who, most people who go to prison, uh, are getting out someday, and we need to make sure that while they're in, uh, on the inside, get some kind of training, get some kind of skills so they can be prepared for, for the life that awaits them when they get out. Joseph, do uh, you have a question? I notice as we talk about these issues, I hear two kinds of conversations going on. A bunch of us are talking about who's got to get the babies out of the river because they've been stuck there, and some of us are talking about who's putting the babies in the river in the first place. It seems to me the system as a community of Baton Rouge, as a community of Louisiana and the United States, we need to have a system that allows the opportunity for everybody to have a job, have an education, and have a reasonable chance at a reasonable lifestyle. And right now in Louisiana, we know that uh, it takes 2.1 full-time equivalent <coughs> salaries at minimum wage to be able to afford housing at 30% of your gross income. That's a lot of numbers that kind of boil out to you're at risk of being homeless unless you've got more than 2.1 people working in your house to get a two-bedroom apartment to house you and your two kids. That's not doable by a single parent, and it's often not doable by two parents to do that sort of thing. That's a system issue that we have to create, an economic system that works for all, that gives everybody opportunities in education. And the two key pieces of that are really do you have jobs and do they pay enough, and do you do the education so people can get to those jobs? The second piece we're talking about is all these fixes for what happens when this doesn't work right. And, and we're talking about those fixes, and they have incredible economic impact on us. It, you just mentioned the one about the prisons. Well, I'm helping pay for that stuff every day when I pay my taxes, and it's costly. And we know that people in Louisiana are incredibly nice. I mean, when you think of, of what we do as a community, you look around the people helping here with Reginald Brown and all y'all, 50% of the people in Baton Rouge housed somebody after Hurricane Katrina. 75% contributed to that. We're a nice people. The difficulty is coming to some consensus of what builds the system that most of us are going to be taking care of in a way because we can work, we can get jobs, and then getting to the ones that don't because we're always not going to be perfect. What are the systems we use to get those people back on track after something fails? So, so, what, mean, do we, so what do we do? I, I, you know, I personally think that um, we, you're right, we've been talking about these issues as if they are disconnected. Well, we think about this work as an ecosystem, and you, you just summed it up. And I think as we start to press on one end um, with programs and great services, then, then Jan's work on policy has to support that, or, and vice versa, the policy work has to support programs and services and initiative, both public sector, private sector, uh, nonprofits, that actually provide a continuum of support and services that regardless of where a person finds themselves in this, in this system, they have a pathway to success. Um, we think about that all the time in terms of our philanthropic work. How do we engage our corporate partners who, who, are, who are donating considerable amounts of dollars to work in this system? How do we engage public dollars that need to be aligned with those private dollars to actually start to move people along. The disconnect that someone talked about earlier between the red tape or, or the bureaucracy that, that 
that sometimes locks people out of opportunity, uh, we really need to take a look at that. And so I, I think that it's not a, um, and I've said this in my opening comments, it's not a single solution. It's not, uh, we call it a, a single um, single bullet. It's a single, it's a, it's a buckshot. And, and I think we need all of these things working together. One of, the, one of the most promising things that I'm seeing in the state of Louisiana is that we're starting to have conversations um, between departments. We're starting to have conversations with the new WIO Act that requires partnership and collaboration, that requires us to intentionally think about not just the individual program, but the system of services and programs and how to make that work uh, better, uh, both efficiently, <coughs> so we're not wasting taxpayer dollars, but, but, but leverage the, the resources that we do have available to us. And I, I don't think there's a way around actually continuously improving what we're doing every day. Jan, we've got about a minute left. Do you want to, you want to try to sum that, uh, sum that up? What do, we do? what do we do about the working poor state? Um, well, we're at an interesting moment. We have an election coming up on Saturday, and we're going to get a new perspective on this. And I think both of the candidates uh, have said some interesting things and, and I think have shown a real interest in this uh, issue in the way that maybe we haven't seen from this administration. So I think this is a time to be very hopeful, uh, and, and I hope that, that we can all come together and, and kind of, again, it's going to take uh, the private sector, it's going to take charities, it's going to take uh, the work of everybody in this room, but it's also going to take smart policy and people working together. And again, there is no one solution to poverty, but I think uh, it, the, it starts with having a public commitment to it, and, and hopefully we'll get that starting on Saturday and moving into the next four years. And, and, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the, the future. It's a, it, it's, it's a consequential election that we're, we're having, and that issue of poverty has not been discussed very much, has it? No, it hasn't. It, it has not been discussed enough, but, but it certainly has not been on the agenda for the past eight years. And, and I think so. so Moving forward, we get to we get to reset this issue, uh, and and I think this is a, a time to really kind of refocus, recalibrate, and we're going to have a big conversation about the budget and state policy. And right. I think, uh, you know, I used to not be a f in favor of term limits, but but I've changed my mind. I'm glad that we get to kind of reset the uh, reset the stage, and, and hopefully poverty will play a central role in, in the next administration. Well, thank you all for a very good discussion. Great questions tonight from our. Uh, panelists and our, our audience and, and we appreciate you being here and your participation and all the good work that you do in, in our community and in our state. So we've uh, run out of time for our question and answer segment tonight. We'd like to thank the panelists, uh, Mr. Dixon, Ms. Wiesner, Mr. Goss and Mr. Muller for their insight on this month's topic and we'll come back and have a few closing comments. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. While you're there, take this month's survey, view additional sound bites, and comment on tonight's show. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching, and good night, everyone. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you.